In a previous video, I talked about the greatest opportunity for the Confederate States to win the American Civil War and secure independence. If you haven't watched the video, it's linked in the description. In this video, I will explore the ramifications of an independent South and how it affects world history via a counterfactual exercise. I'd also like to issue a trigger warning that I will be getting political in this video. This should be obvious because history is impossible to divorce from politics, but your jimmies may be at a risk of rustling. If you or a loved one have been diagnosed with an inability to have a civil discussion on the internet, I recommend clicking off this video now. Those of you who have chosen to remain, I hope you enjoy. This counterfactual exercise will begin in August 1861, after a peace treaty is signed ending the American Civil War and recognizing the independence of the Confederate States. In our timeline, Santiago Vidari, the governor of the Mexican state of Nuevo León and Coahuila, offered his state to be annexed by the Confederacy in late August of 1861. This offer was rejected by Confederate President Jefferson Davis because the Confederacy was still at war with the Union. Davis anticipated that the European powers would intervene in Mexico, violating the Monroe Doctrine leading to a war between America and Europe that would lead to the latter's recognition of Southern independence. But in this timeline, with the Confederacy already independent, there would be little incentive not to annex Nuevo León and Coahuila. This would almost certainly have provoked a war with Mexico, a war that the Confederacy would almost certainly have won. Mexico had just finished its own civil war and was in no military position to stop a Confederate invasion. On top of that, many notable Confederate generals had fought against Mexico 15 years earlier during the Mexican War. The Union wouldn't be keen on starting another war at the South so soon after losing the Civil War, but would likely send limited amounts of aid to Mexico. Not that it would help much, but it's something. President Benito Juarez, likely fearing a complete conquest of Mexico, would be forced to cede northern Mexican states to the Confederacy. The loss of this relatively brief war would undermine the legitimacy of the Mexican libtards, and a coup attempt by the conservatives would probably occur, although I'm not sure who would end up in control of Mexico and for how long. On the subject of Mexico, would it still be invaded by Britain, France, and Spain in December 1861? Most likely. The Juarez administration suspended debt payments to Europe in July, and the lack of a union response to the Confederate invasion would convince the colonial empires they could fuck around wouldn't have to find out. The Union would protest both the European invasion as well as Napoleon III's attempt to install a monarchy. The Confederacy, seeking to uphold the Monroe Doctrine and secure its own influence in Latin America, would follow suit. It's even possible that an agreement for mutual cooperation and security of the Western Hemisphere would have been included in the peace treaty that ended the Civil War. Whatever the circumstances, both nations would still be reluctant to declare war on France. Considering that the French pushed Juarez all the way to the Rio Grande in our timeline, with less territory needing to be conquered and the libtards discredited by the war at the Confederacy, Emperor Napoleon III of France would likely have succeeded in setting up his conservative-backed puppet monarchy in Mexico. Benito Juarez would either be captured or go into exile, while Maximilian I would assume the throne of Mexico. This event would have major ramifications on the two American nations to the north. The threat of Napoleon III's territorial designs in the Western Hemisphere as part of his grand design for the Americas would force them to cooperate, overshadowing whatever hard feelings that might have existed prior. The two countries would financially support Mexican anti-monarchist groups, and it's possible that mercenaries or volunteer militias could participate in rebellions as well. In the Union, the Republican Party would be permanently discredited by its loss in the Civil War and might even be opposed to international cooperation with the Confederacy. In the 1864 election, even if Lincoln did choose to run for re-election, he would have lost and a Democrat would have become president. Maybe Ripped Lincoln would be called Ripped Davis instead, who knows? The most likely presidential candidate to win, in my opinion, would be former Connecticut Governor Thomas H. Seymour. Seymour ran for the Democratic nomination in our timeline's 1864 presidential election and was the leader of the Connecticut Peace Democrats. As such, he would likely support a policy of cooperation and rapprochement with the Confederacy. In 1867, Jefferson Davis's term as Confederate president would end, and a new commander-in-chief would have to be chosen. My bets would be on former Confederate Secretary of State Robert Toombs. Toombs had previously tried to become president in 1861 and was opposed to the attack on Fort Sumter. Meaning, like Seymour, he would probably support friendly post-war relations with the Union. Toombs also had interest in expanding Confederate power in Latin America and turning Mexico into a protectorate, which would give him more appeal to Southern expansionists. A joint military intervention in Mexico would probably occur around the same time as the Franco-Prussian War, which would still happen in this timeline. 
France would be forced to withdraw troops to fight against Germany, which would leave Mexico vulnerable. The joint American armies would swiftly take Mexico City, overthrow Maximilian I, and establish a Republican form of government. Would the Union still buy Alaska from the Russians? Most likely. Alaska had been offered to the United States before the Civil War, and the decision to purchase the territory was very popular in our timeline. In addition, Seymour was the foreign minister to Russia during the Pierce administration and friends with both Nicholas I and Alexander II. As such, I don't see much of a reason why the Union would refuse to buy Alaska. The Confederacy would also be undergoing its own expansion. In our timeline, Santo Domingo, seeking to avoid being reconquered by Haiti, asked to be annexed by the United States or at least become a protectorate. Given the closer distance to the Confederacy in this timeline, the Dominican Republic would probably have turned to them with the offer, which the Confederacy would accept to expand its influence in the Caribbean Sea. Another prominent focus of the Confederacy would be Cuba. In our timeline, Cuban nationalists revolted against Spanish rule in 1868, and I see little reason why they wouldn't in this timeline. Given that one of the revolt's aims was to abolish slavery, the Confederacy would have intervened in Cuba to crush the revolutionaries. If the rebellion isn't over by 1872, the Confederacy could have even tried to annex Spanish possessions of the Caribbean once the Third Carlist War breaks out. The Spanish, being an ocean away from their empire, devastated by four years of war and possessing an inferior navy, would have little means of reversing these conquests. Spain might have attempted to get the British to join them in retaking Cuba under the guise of reversing the expansion of slavery, but it's doubtful they would agree to this. Such intervention would violate the Monroe Doctrine and could draw the Union into the dispute on the side of the Confederacy. Not wanting to risk the loss of Canada or any Caribbean colonies, the British would have left the Spanish to their fate. Following this brief period of expansion and reassertion of the Monroe doctrine, the Union and the Confederacy would once again be isolated in their hemisphere and primarily focus on internal affairs. With the Republican Party discredited as a major political party and probably dissolved after the war, slavery would survive longer in the United States. Abolitionists would be blamed for dividing the country and the movement would experience a major setback. The federal government would be forced to tread carefully in the affairs of the four slave states that didn't secede in order to avoid provoking another war. Depending on what direction the Union takes politically, it's possible that the border states could eventually agree to compensated emancipation down the road. Since the Confederate Constitution allowed for slaves to be imported from the Union, perhaps a deal could be worked out where slave owners who opposed compensated emancipation would have the option to immigrate to the Confederacy. With the religious conservative South being its own country, American politics would be overall more libtarded in this timeline. The Democratic Party would split in two over time, and something similar to the Progressive Era might occur earlier than in reality. This time period is also likely when the aforementioned compensated emancipation could have occurred. These political divides wouldn't strain relations between the Union and the Confederacy too much, as the two nations would want to remain allies simply because they wouldn't have to deal with the hostile power on their border if they weren't enemies. Similar to the United States and the United Kingdom in our timeline, a shared language, culture, and institutions would also serve as a powerful cohesive force to keep the two nations on good terms. Because the United States would never fight a war with Spain in this timeline, I'm not sure what would happen to the Philippines. In our timeline, Spain sold much of their Pacific colonial empire to Germany in the 1890s, and the Germans did have interest in the archipelago. The Japanese had also offered to purchase the Philippines from Spain, so the colony could probably end up in the hands of either empire. Hawaii would probably still be annexed by the United States for a lot of the same reasons it was in our timeline, although without a Spanish-American war, I'm not sure when it would occur. Away down south, the land of traders was devastated by the Civil War in our timeline. The value of southern agricultural land relative to the north was cut by 75%. Industrial output relative to the north, 50%. Southern wealth, 60%. Over 50% of farm machinery was wrecked. Thousands of miles of railroads were torn up and hundreds of miles of bridges were destroyed. In terms of loss of life, 40% of livestock and 20% of white males of military age were dead by 1865. In this timeline, with the war ending in a few months, this devastation wouldn't have occurred. The south, if it were independent, it would have been the fourth richest nation on earth in 1860, and its economy would have continued to grow in the years after the Civil War. In our timeline, the price of southern cotton after 1865 was substantially higher than before the war, and only fell below pre-war levels temporarily in the mid-1890s. The British in particular consistently imported more cotton from the south than from Egypt, India, or Brazil. In addition, Confederate control of Cuba means control of the Cuban sugar industry. Throughout the 19th century, Cuban sugar consistently made up around 14% of the global output and composed over 20% by the mid 1920s. Of course, the Confederacy wouldn't be a solely agricultural economy. Anthonymous Grandis would still migrate to the south in the late 19th century and necessitate a shift towards the industrial economy. This push probably could have come even earlier, as even contemporary secessionists advocated for industrialization to enhance the Confederacy's status as a great power. Confederates also realized that industrialization was compatible with slavery, and hundreds of thousands of slaves were used for industrial labor before the Civil War. 
Even the constitutional restrictions on the economy, such as prohibiting government-funded internal improvements in Article 1, Section 9, were outright ignored in our timeline and probably would have been amended out of the Constitution anyways. In the modern day, companies utilize foreign forced labor to manufacture cheap products overseas. In this timeline, European and even Northern companies would do something similar. Foreign corporations would purchase agricultural and industrial slaves in the Confederacy that would manufacture cheap products to sell overseas. The discovery of oil in Texas in the early 20th century would also encourage investment toward the Confederacy. However, this would have the downside of only further entrenching slavery in the Confederate States, which would never be abolished. While there would almost certainly be slave revolts, I doubt they would get very far given the abject failure of every slave revolt in the South in our timeline. If I were to compare life in the Confederate to a modern day country, I would compare it to Qatar, in which life would generally be okay as long as you're not part of a forced labor underclass. In Latin America, the Confederacy would take advantage of the instability the region is known for to prop up right-wing dictatorships willing to serve its interests. Any regimes that don't legalize slavery outright would allow for foreign slaveholders to bring their slaves into their country for business interests. The United States, with its economic ties to the Confederate States and not having any colliding interests, would largely turn a blind eye to this and focus on the Pacific. By 1914, the Confederate States of America would be among the great powers of the world. The South's manufacturing output was greater than the Italian and Austro-Hungarian output in our timeline, and might have even exceeded the French in this timeline. 1914 is also coincidentally the year some Serbs shot some Austrian and Bosnia and started yet another European war. Come on guys, you were doing so well after Napoleon, what happened? The German Empire's U-boat campaign in the Atlantic Ocean would have led the Union and the Confederacy to sympathize with the Allies, although neither American nation would actively seek to intervene in the European War. And yes, I do say allies instead of entente because I don't speak fucking snail eater. However, with Mexico under direct American influence, the Zimmerman telegram would never be sent and neither nation would join the war. Despite the lack of American intervention, the allies would still win World War I. Matt Mitrovich has an excellent video on this topic that I'll link in the description, but I also want to add to the discussion. Germany's 1918 spring offensive faced odds of such a ridiculous length that I can think of only three words to describe people who think that the spring offensive could have won the war. You're fucking delusional. The Kaiser shit lacked a consistent strategic objective, which is always a good sign of success when you don't know what your offensive is supposed to accomplish. The German Empire was also on the verge of an economic collapse, and the army faced supply issues that forced them to halt multiple times regardless of Allied resistance. Fuel for German aircraft and tanks was limited, and they had less of these vehicles than the Allies did. Germany was also on the brink of starvation thanks to the Royal Navy's blockade, and German soldiers were forced to steal food from the Allies during the offensive. Even in the territory that Germany managed to conquer, it lacked the mobile units to reinforce these gains, which were thus vulnerable to an Allied counterattack. The idea that this joke of an offensive with no coherent goals and insufficient logistics could have ever succeeded in taking Paris, let alone allowing the central powers to come back from the brink of collapse, is crackpipe history only rivaled by Waterfall Hiss videos. While the Allies would still win World War I, the circumstances would be changed significantly without American intervention. Without Woodrow Wilson's policy of Europe-only self-determination, the 1915 Treaty of London would not be overturned at the peace conferences. As such, Italy would receive the territory promised in the treaty, including including on the Dalmatian coast, the Dodecanese Islands, and the expansion of Italian colonies in Africa. This would prevent Benito Mussolini from becoming dictator, although a far-right anti-communist ideology would still develop, even if it doesn't originate in Italy. It's entirely possible for an equivalent ideology to develop in the reactionary white supremacist state of the Confederacy. In Russia, the Red Army would still win the Russian Civil War, and the Soviet Union would still exist. The anti-war American Socialist Party would still exist in the United States and wouldn't decline in membership after World War I, and a less conservative United States would probably be more accepting of leftism. In our timeline, African Americans living in the Jim Crow era South were influenced by Marxist rhetoric regarding the liberation of the working class. Martin Luther King Jr., the famous civil rights hero, referred to himself as a socialist or private and believed America should move towards democratic socialism. In this timeline, there would probably be a red scare in the Confederacy over the fear of a slave revolt. It wouldn't actually matter whether or not any slave revolts actually occur, and the fact that the Confederate system would be well insulated against the socialist revolution would be irrelevant. All it takes is a perceived left threat to make a conservative go from singing Star Spangled Banner to springtime for Hitler. The increased political divide between the Union and the Confederacy put the two nations on the road to war for the first time in over 60 years. The two nations would compete for dominance in the Western Hemisphere and gradually become more politically extreme. Both nations would also be at risk of political instability. The Confederacy might one day deal with a slave revolt too big to put down, and the Union could experience a Wall Street-backed coup if the federal government becomes too left-leaning. 
Internationally, the British and French could join the Confederates, the Japanese, and possibly even a greater Germany that managed to unify with Austria in 1919 in an anti-communist racial supremacist alliance. The United States, in turn, could form its own alliance with the Soviet Union and whichever Latin American countries go red. From here, the future of the timeline is uncertain. Would the Union and the Confederacy be able to stave off potential revolutions? How would the balance of power evolve in the 1930s? If World War II still happens, which side would win? How many ad hominems and unsubstantiated claims will I have to deal with as a result of making this video? Let me know what you think in the comments. I'm the Counterfactor, and thanks for watching. Big bang bang roll, got cheat codes Certified in the hood, boy, they all know Don't be asking y'all a stitch, you gotta know to know Got a pocket full of cash, so the whole boat See, I've been thugging since a young and I ain't got a bang My name been ringing bow since I was like 14 Bitch, service stacking from all of the dope fiends And I ain't tripping, y'all could get it, you ain't get from me